Hi, glad you could join us. Most weekdays I try to do some exercise first thing in the morning. Recently I've been enjoying walking in the countryside around our home, come rain or shine. As the walk takes about 40 minutes, it's a good opportunity for me to listen to some worship songs. So physical and spiritual exercise, walking and worshiping as I go along. There's some stunning scenery around here. So every now and again, I stop to enjoy the view. The first part of the walk is a bit of a stretch as it goes uphill for about half a mile to St Ellie's Church. It certainly gets me breathing deeply. Recently, I've been finding some brambles and stinging nettles have been growing out over the road. As the road is narrow in places, and as cars sometimes come speeding down the hill, I try to walk as close to the hedge as possible. But this can sometimes be tricky with a big stingy nettle nearby. It's odd, I know, but I've just put up with this for weeks. It didn't occur to me that I could do anything about it. Until one day, my hat got caught in a bramble hanging out quite high up. And that day I realised I had to get rid of these obstacles to my daily walk. So, sure enough, next day I took the secateurs with me. As I walked along, if I came to any bramble or stinging nettle that would cause a nuisance to me, or to any other walker, I would cut it off. Take that, you're out of my life. Take that, take that. My walk has been a lot easier since. Every now and again, I come across a new hindrance, but now I know what to do. I come prepared. It was not good enough just to do the good thing, to go on a healthy walk each day. I also had to get rid of the bad thing that hindered my journeying. In our series through the ancient book of Leviticus in the Hebrew scriptures, we've also been on a journey. We've seen how God redeemed his people out of slavery and set them free to walk with him. We call it the exodus, which means a going out, going out from bondage. But as God's people had been slaves for hundreds of years, God needed a way to transform them from thinking and acting like slaves to thinking and acting like saints. This was the purpose of the tabernacle, God's sanctuary among his people and the book of Leviticus tells us about the sanctifying and transforming process. God wanted his people regularly to go on the spiritual journey into the sanctuary and drawing near to God and so becoming holy like him and then to move out of the sanctuary to live as a holy nation in the world, shining the light of God on others. And we've followed that journey, the journey inwards to nearness and the journey outwards in holiness. And now we've come to the final chapters and God instructs his people on how to live 
in the good of this transforming journey while journeying in the real world. How is that possible? Well, the answer is to walk with God day by day in his world. Our chapter, chapter 26, is made up of three pairs of actions. In the first pair, God refers to his people's actions. You shall not, you shall. And in the third pair, in contrast, God refers to his own actions. I will not, I will. And in the middle pair, there's a combination of the people's actions and God's actions. If you do this, then I will do that. So, the first pair, our actions, verses 1 and 2. You shall not make idols, nor set up an image for yourselves, nor place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. The negative instruction is about fake gods, but the positive instruction is about genuine spirituality. If you and I are going to live well in the world, we need to get rid of fake gods in our lives and we need to devote ourselves to genuine spirituality. We, we've all heard in recent years about fake news, but there is such a thing as fake gods. The verse suggests the fake gods grow in significance, making them first, maybe individually and privately, then setting them up in our lives, maybe publicly and openly, and then establishing them in our land, so becoming part of our culture and everyone bowing down and worshipping them. God warns us about allowing fake gods to take over more and more. What are the things in our lives or in our society and culture that we have come to accept but are in fact fake gods? Things we've made, things we've set up in our homes and in our countries or things we, we're giving devotion to. This is not a fake question. Let's ask it again. What are the things in our lives or in our society and culture that we've come to accept but are in fact fake gods? Things we've made, things we've set up in our homes and in our country or things we're giving our devotion to. God makes it clear. He says, if you're going to walk with me as a holy nation, you're to get rid of those negative hindrances in your life. It's no good leaving them there and trying to dodge them like stinging nettles or brambles, as every day they'll get more and more of a hindrance. You have to remove the fake gods which are hindering your holy living. We need to get out the spiritual secateurs and remove them. But what about the positive instruction to God's people? Not just to get rid of the fake gods that hinder us, but also positively to give time and space to things that make us spiritually healthy. It says to keep God's Sabbath. 
and to reverence his sanctuary. The sanctuary was like the sacred place and the Sabbath was like the sacred time. The Sabbath was like a sanctuary in time. For us now, these are not necessarily physical, but spiritual. Do we practice and respect and observe and keep and guard and even reverence our space time with God? It's so easy to make excuses. Oh, I'm so exhausted from my busy day. Or because the kids have been on top of me all day. Or because I'm looking after my elderly mother. Or just because I forgot. I can't spend time with God each day or time with God and his people, the church, each week because of this or that. God says, no, wake up. If you're going to walk with me in this tough old world, you need not only to get rid of the fake gods, but you need to invest space time with God and his people to listen to his voice and to worship him. Do we bow down in our lives to fake gods? Or do we bow down to the true God? That's the question. What are we revering and reverencing and devoting our time to? But what about the third pair of actions in this chapter over against the actions for us as God's people? What has God promised for himself? Verse 42 to 45 says, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, and I will remember my covenant with the land, and I will not reject them or break my covenant with them. I am the Lord their God. I will remember for their sakes the covenant with their ancestors whom I brought out from the land of Egypt in the eyes of the nations to be to them as God. I am the Lord. I will remember my covenant with this people. Four times it says, I will remember. And five times it refers to his covenant and it finishes with the reason why. Because I am the Lord their God. Whatever we, his people, get caught up with, he has committed himself to us. He's the Lord our God. And even if we turn our backs on him, he remains faithful to his own name and to his covenant. You and I are secure in his love and faithfulness. And there's even a special word for it in the Hebrew scriptures. Chesed, the covenant love of God. His loving kindness because he's committed himself to us. However up or down we've been in our obedience to God, he will always remain faithful to us. It says, even when we've wandered far away, when we're in exile, spiritually speaking, he will not break his covenant with us. He has shown this clearly in history. When Israel was in slavery in Egypt, he redeemed them out from the slave market and he brought them to freedom. Exodus will forever be the founding story for God's people. Why? Because of his covenant. We too were in slavery to sin and God sent his son into our world and 
redeemed us and brought us out from slavery, will he now break his covenant with us? No, of course, he has promised to remember his covenant forever. God has committed himself to us, so we are safe and secure. But finally, what about the middle pair of paragraphs? Pair one is about you, instructions for God's people. Pair three is about I, obligations for God himself. But in the middle pair, pair two, God says, it's about you and I. God says, if you do this, then I will do this. As we've seen from the third pair, our eternal blessing does not depend on our faithfulness, but on God's. However, our current blessing does depend upon our walking with God in fellowship and obedience to his voice. Verse 3 to 13 gives the blessings if we listen to his voice and walk with him. And verse 14 to 41 give the disciplines if we don't listen to his voice. So God says, if you then I. It's like Eden on the one side and exile on the other side. Read verse 3 to 4. If you walk in my statutes, then I will. God says, if you walk in my statutes and if you keep my commands and do them, then I will give you rains in their time and the earth will give her produce, and the trees of the field will yield their fruit. For Israel, with their promises involving a land, then their blessings were physical. But for us, our blessings are primarily spiritual. Listen to the words in verses 12 to 13. I will walk about among you, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt, from being slaves to them, and I broke the bars of your yoke and caused you to walk uprightly. Because God has established his covenant with us, he calls us to walk with him in his world. It's like Eden again, with God walking about with us day by day. God has brought us out of slavery and broken the bars of our yoke and he's now our God and we are now his people and he makes us to walk uprightly in the world. Not with our heads bowed down like slaves, but walking uprightly as his holy people. So, we are walking with God in his world. What is our daily walk like? To walk healthily and uprightly, we need to take two actions. As we've seen, we need to give space time to listening to God's voice each day and each week. Sabbath and sanctuary. And also, we need to get rid of false gods in our lives and to worship only the true one. He promises always to keep his covenant with us, but he wants us to walk every day in the good of his presence. What a challenge. Eden or exile. If we are Exodus people, people God has brought out from slavery, then he wants us to walk with him like in Eden, hearing his voice and walking uprightly in his world. So what must 
you do? What must I do now? What actions must we take today and tomorrow and every day to guard God's Sabbath and to revere his sanctuary and to, to cut out fake gods in our lives? Thank you, Paul. Let's pray. Dear yeah, Father, I just want to pray that we would know how to deal with these things that are in our lives that are stopping us having that close relationship with you. They are obstacles in our walk in life, in our Christian walk in life. And Father, I pray that we would have your wisdom to know what they are and your spirit to be able to have the strength to deal with them and to cut them out from our life. Father, I pray that you draw close to us. Show us your paths. Show us how to deal with these things that are in our life, which you don't like to see there. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.